Without any further ado, I'm going to turn it over to George Witten, who's got a message from heaven with us. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Awesome. For those that don't get our briefs, you know, I want to, I want to really implore, implore upon you really my heart for the brief. My heart is actually that you have your prayer points for the day, that you know how to pray today. There are so many things that are happening in the world, and the reality is that the news should simply fa be facts. These are what I need to pray through today. And obviously, the world's getting very, very crazy. If you want to get our uh, Facebook, we just started a Facebook page again. You know, how many people have been in Facebook jail? Okay, well, I got out again, praise God. Um, I, I've done my time, and now I restarted. I'm going to talk about a very controversial subject, but it's not controversial if you understand what the Word of God says, because this will give you an understanding of how close we are, and we are prophetic beings. You know, God has given us the spirit of prophecy. Why? So we could actually fulfill our calling, so that we would have a sense of urgency, so that we could actually do what we're called to do. That we're not to stick our head in the sand, but we're actually called to go ahead and redeem this world. God didn't call us to escape this world. God called us to redeem this world. And we're in a season of redemption. So I want to talk about something that's very controversial, but it's not that controversial once you understand it, right? Over and over again, we're seeing a lot of talk about another temple, right? And we've been seeing a talk, you know, when Donald Trump moved the embassy to Jerusalem in 2017, hey, they created a temple coin. They go ahead and, and, and from that point, they started sacrificing again. They started having sacrifices on the temple. Then you had the Temple Institute put into place a, 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 a herd of red heifers trying to produce a red heifer. Just last week, there was uh, rabbis in Texas that inspected two red heifers that are potential candidates and will know within a year if they are actually legit. Okay, This is very key for them in order to set up the next temple. You know, last week, or maybe this might be two weeks now, the lawmakers were, were debating on the Knesset right at Tishba Av, the ninth of Av, talking about setting up the entrance way in. Now, when talking about this subject and talking about any subject in the word, you actually have to have the right key. If you don't have the right key, you can go into left field, right field, all over the place, right? I remember when I was 16, I had a red Nissan Sentra. And this red Nissan Sentra, you know, I remember pulling into the 7-Eleven. I get out of the 7-Eleven. I go in. I pick up a Mountain Dew, a bag of chips. I come out. I jump into a red Nissan Sentra. I said, man, this seat's really far back. You know, I try to adjust the seat, put the key in. That key doesn't start the car. <laughs> Lo and behold, the biggest black guy I think I ever met, you know, I at the time was like five foot and this guy was like 6'3". He felt like a, a mountain. And he comes out extremely angry because someone is stealing his car. I look to the right of me, and lo and behold, there's another red Nissan Sentra. It looked the same. It had the same. I didn't have the right key. If you're studying anything in the Word, especially in Torah, especially in Hot Torah, and especially the entire Word, you have to have the right key. The key is Yeshua. If Yeshua, right, is the center of heaven, he's in the center of worship, and he's the center of all the, 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 the living elders, and the myriads of angels were worshiping the Lamb of God that was presented before us, then he is the key that unlocks all the mysteries. You know, it says in Revelation 19 that he is the word of God, right? And so now we're going to talk about something. The first thing you have to understand is that the Bible specifically says in Zechariah 6, right, the branch shall build the temple. The very next verse, God doesn't want you to miss this fact because he says, even so, the branch shall build the temple. He says it back to back. And he says that he shall sit and rule on his throne, there shall be what? A priest on his throne. He is a king and a priest. He's from the priesthood of what? Melchizedek. Right? So this is a very important understanding because who is the branch? The branch 
And Jeremiah 23 says, this is the king. What is the king's name? yud vav is our righteousness. What does it say in Corinthians? He that knew no sin became sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him. He is our righteousness. The branch that is building the temple is the Lord himself. Right? That's the first thing. Right now, the, the, the Ramban, they say, look, the person will know the person's the Messiah if he builds the temple. The question is, what temple is being built? And you have to go through, and as you start studying the word, you'll realize that the Bible has nine chapters, Ezekiel 40 to 48. And it talks about this temple. The dimensions of this temple are actually debatable. But the one thing you have to understand is it's very large, right? Matthew Henry's commentary puts it 80 miles one way, 30 miles another way, 25 miles one way, 10 miles the other way. This is how big it is, right? That's 80 by 30. This is 25 by 10. It doesn't fit in Jerusalem. So you have to first understand that the geography of the world is going to radically be different. When the Lord comes back and puts his feet on the Mount of Olives, right, there is an earthquake of earthquakes, and it literally talks about in Isaiah that every mountain is leveled and every hill raised and there's a giant plain. Okay? So there's this huge thing. Now you have to understand, right? There are going to be survivors. They're going to repopulate the world. And Zechariah 12, as it talks about everyone from the nations are going to worship Sukkot. They're going to worship year to year. It talks about if they don't worship Sukkot, They'll have no rain. I venture to say no one's going to skip Sukkot. So what's the first thing you have to understand is this. When the Lord comes back and rules and reigns, how many people do you think will be alive if there's no more disease like we understand it? No more abortion. No more birth control. No more wars. There's going to be thousands upon thousands, millions upon millions, billions upon billions by the time we get to the end of the thousand years. That's why the area is so big. It has to fit a lot of people, okay? So it doesn't fit right now. The next thing is this, that when the temple is built, it talks about Ezekiel, we'll know it's a real temple if the water coming out actually goes into the Dead Sea See, the temple is life. The Ezekiel temple talks about the river of life coming out. It actually goes into the Dead Sea. Where I live in Angeti will no longer be called the Dead Sea. It will become alive. There are going to be great fish. There's going to be a whole host of fish there. There's going to be a great situation happening. So all the things that the Temple Institute are preparing. See, without Yeshua as the key... They're preparing for a high priest. Yeshua is our high priest, right? They've gone ahead, and it talks about setting up a priesthood. In Isaiah, there's a great passage here talking about when the Lord comes back, that he's actually going to take amongst the Gentiles priests. It's an amazing thought that in the future, there's going to be a radical difference. Right now, they've created a menorah. But if you read the Ezekiel 40 to 48 passage, you will not find a menorah mentioned. Why? Because John 8 says Yeshua is the light of the world. He's sitting in the temple. They, they're gonna go, they've created a table of showbread. But Yeshua is the very bread of life. That's why it's not mentioned. It talks about the, the holy of holies. So they're trying to create a holy of holies, but there is no holy of holies. The veil was torn... The Ezekiel passage actually doesn't mention a holy of holies. It actually mentions where the holy of holies is, is where the very throne of God is. Okay? So now the key is, what was in the throne of God? What was in the holy of holies that's not mentioned? The Ark of the Covenant. This passage here in Jeremiah 3, 16 17 says, look, the Ark of the Covenant's not going to come to mind anymore. Raiders of the Lost Ark got it wrong. Okay? It's not going to come to mind anymore when the Lord comes back. 
It says, at that time, you, where was the Holy of Holies? It's where the throne of God is. The passage here says, at that time, they called Jerusalem what? The throne of Yudhe It's the very throne area. What was in the Holy of What was in the Ark of the Covenant? See, the Ark of the Covenant, when you start understanding the topology, you'll realize there were actually called to be Arks of the Covenant. See, the, 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 the Holy Spirit was within us. And if you look at all the pictures of the ark and what was in the ark, right? It was the manna loaves, right? Manna, what is it? When people look at you, they ought to be saying, man, that love coming out of you, what is that? What is that peace coming out? See, manna, the bread of life, should be springing out of us. And people will say, I, I want some of that, right? Aaron's rod, a rod is dead. It's a dead stick. It budded. It became alive. When you became to faith, you were once dead, now become alive, right? And finally, you have the, the, the tablets of the covenant. Now it's the Holy Spirit written, the Spirit upon the hearts of men. So we live in a different situation happening. The key to understanding the Ezekiel temple really is in the word altar. I pulled out this passage here in Ezekiel 40, 43, 13 through 16. If you go to 17... The first word is Mizbeach. Mizbeach is the normal word that you use for the, the, uh, the altar. The second word changes. In 43.15, our English still says altar. It literally is ha Ha-Ha-El, the mountain of God. It is the only place that it's used. And then in 43.16, the word changes again. It's ha Ariel. The Lion of God. The first thing you have to understand is that when the Lord sets up his temple, it's going to be called the Mountain of the Lord. It's a picture of where the mountain is. It's a picture of where the altar is. It is the mountain because all the mountains around it have been leveled. That is why it's called the Mountain of the Lord. That's why it says that the Lord will go ahead and, and spring forth from Jerusalem. He will teach the law. He will write upon our hearts. And guess what? The world's going to be at peace again, right? The second thing is that who is the Lion of, of God? Yeshua is the very Lion of God. So all the sacrifices that were before, I actually should go back to, the, well, I'll explain it this way. In Ezekiel, it talks about sin sacrifice. But it's a different world in the future because the sinner, right, that is, is, is specifically sinned, and he has sinned, and is purposely sinned, it says his, his days will be cut off. God is going to come back. The Lord has come back ruling with a rod of iron. But there's going to be sin that happens through error and ignorance. They didn't know. Whatever that is. But atonement has to be made so the temple can be used. And that's what it talks about throughout because we know that all the sacrifices that happened before were a shadow of the good things to come. What was the good thing to come? That Yeshua died for us once and for all. And that he goes ahead and he is sanctified in us. The Spirit of God. And he's made atonement for us. And now he's sitting at the right hand of God. And by his blood, he's allowed us to come into the Holy of Holies. The veil has already been torn. That we have access now to the Holy of Holies. And now he is now the mediator of a new covenant. This new covenant that couldn't be done anymore. So all the sacrifices that happen in the future. While all the sacrifices were looking toward Yeshua before Yeshua came. When the Lord comes back. We will be reminded for a thousand years. Every Pesach. Every Passover. The sacrifice that Yeshua did for us. We will not be able to forget how awesome this was. How awesome this atonement was for us. And so now as we continue on, we know that the Bible talks about the abomination of desolation. Yeshua said, look, when you see these things, he says, understand this. It's a very big deal to understand what has taken place. So we now know that the abomination of desolation was connected to Hanukkah. Hanukkah, the great feast. This is why it's important to actually study Hanukkah, right? 
Hanukkah, they went ahead and tried to dedicate. It was this, this time in John where Yeshua came. And when he came, he came during the Feast of Dedication. That's Hanukkah. And the Jewish people, they were saying, hey, they were expecting someone to deliver them from Rome. What they were celebrating was the fact that the Maccabees had delivered them from the, from the Greek uh, emperor Antiochus Epiphanes. When he delivered them, they said, okay, we're looking for this one. Now, Antiochus Epiphanes was Antiochus Theos Epiphanes, and he, they, he thought he saw himself to be God. So they were anticipating someone like a Maccabee, someone that would go ahead and crush the Roman army. So they said to him, hey, are you the Messiah? Would you please tell us? And as they're celebrating this, he goes ahead and says to them something very peculiar. He says, I and my father are one. When he said that, they were just celebrating the, the thought that someone said that he was God on the temple and the Maccabees had wiped him out. And now all of a sudden, Yeshua said, I am the, I and my father are one. And they went to stone him. Why? Because he committed what? Blasphemy in their eyes. This is a very important understanding because it talks about the last days. This type of situation happened again because the Lord says, look, don't be deceived by any means. Don't be tricked by any means. And it continues on. Whoops, go back. For there's one that's going to go ahead and sit in the temple of God showing himself that he's God. Showing all kinds of signs and lying wonders. And then he's going to go ahead. And this is the key understanding I want to get that you have to understand for tonight. Deception is running rampant. Yeshua is the truth. And look at it says here. Because they received not the love of the truth that it might be saved. Yeshua is extending his hand. He's saying, look, I'm trying to tell you plainly, I am the Messiah that I came and died on the cross, that I paid it all. And if you don't receive it, ready, there's a delusion coming in. This delusion is coming because you received not the love of the truth, and because they did not re receive the love of the truth, that they might be condemned. That God sends such a powerful delusion that you can't believe. In, in Isaiah 66, it's a, another interesting passage talking about the last days. And the Lord literally says, where's the house you're going to build for me? Where's the place you're going to, where's the place of my rest? And look what the Lord says that he looks on. He is looking for those in the last days who is contrite, has a repentant heart that trembles at his word. Then it continues on and talks about how people are going to make false kind of sacrifices in the last days. They're going to take animal sacrifices and they're going to, and then it says in verse 4, there's going to heap upon them a delusion that they're going to run in fear. And you're going to get cast out for his name's sake. He says, Bill, be joyful. Now, why I mention all of these things, and all these things seem to be around the corner, this is the key understanding I wanted you to take from this. The Maccabees prevailed we are like those Maccabees though few in number it said ready the people that know their God shall stand strong and prevail we're living in a day and age where COVID has really magnified who is standing and not walking in fear it has actually set apart the pruning process if you are in fear, it's because you're not reading the book. The end of the book says, we won. It's already a done deal. We are living now in a prophetic time, and we're living in such a time that we see these things happening. It should give us a spirit of urgency, a spirit of, I need to get off my butt. I need to do whatever I can do for the kingdom right now. But right now, you know, the, the, the Bible talks about the last days being like the days of Lot. And most people, when they look at the days of Lot, they're looking at those things and looking at the moral depravity of the world. 
I'm going to flip it. Lot, if he had just touched 10 people, if 10 people had been saved, Abraham had negotiated down to 10. If there's 10 righteous, will you not destroy? And said, if I find 10, I will not destroy. And it says in Peter that Lot's heart was vexed daily by all the sins around him. What had happened was Lot allowed society to silence him. If we allow Facebook to silence us and stop proclaiming and stop worrying about if we're going to get banned, or, we're going to be in trouble. If we're worried about going ahead and speaking truth, we're going to be in trouble. We're in a day and an age where he says, look, he, they that know their God shall prevail. We have a job to do. This is the, 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 whoops. Oh, let me go back here. If you get anything out tonight, learn this chart. This is the population of the world. Is essentially flat. Whoops. Is essentially flat all the way through. It actually never made it more than 200 million people. That means a remnant, say 10%. In any generation before the 1800s, the remnants of these generations, maybe 20 million. We're living in a day and an age where we now have 7.7 .7 billion people. Ready? Our remnant in the last generation will be greater than the remnant of all the generations before us. God chose you to be alive for this day and this season. God chose you to be the last leg of this race. As the baton is passed from generation to generation, person to person. In a relay race, the person that was the one to finish the race was known as the anchor leg. God saw fit that you were alive for this generation because he saw that you were an anchor leg. He didn't call you to bury your talents. The Lord has a very specific warning about burying your talent, being silent, allowing society to silence you. You better read what it says. Because that talent that you buried will be taken away from you and given to those that's, that didn't listen to what the world was saying, but was listening to what God was saying. That we have a message of hope. It is not a message of fear. We are living in these last days. The Bible is telling us these things are happening. He, uh, he told us, did you not think it was going to happen? It should be a wake-up call to reach our friends and our family, to have those serious conversations that we have been avoiding because we're worried about offending someone. We are getting closer and closer where there is no more time. We have to be about his business. If we don't, then I fear it's like the days of Esther. When Mordecai says to Esther something very profound, he said to Esther, you've been brought to the kingdom for such a time as this. And then something else happened. Because Mordecai says to her, look, if you don't do this, don't worry. God will raise up someone else. We don't want to be replaced. We want to be the ones that say, I hear your call. I'm going to go ahead. I'm going to prevail. I do not care about the spirit of Antichrist. Do not be worried about the mark of the beast. Be worried that people look at you and say, that guy is marked by Yeshua. When Peter and John walked, they said to the, 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 the rabbi said at the time, these are unlearned men. But they knew Yeshua. That's how we should be marked in these last days. He knows Yeshua. Because while the world is shaking, he hasn't lost his love. He hasn't lost his peace. 
He hasn't lost his joy. Because we look at these things and we know something. Our redemption is drawing near. That we are now at the last of the last days. We're living at a time when COVID is trying to, actually God is using COVID, I believe, to speak to us. I'm going to close out with this passage. I don't actually have it on the screen. The passage is in Hebrews. And if you want to turn, it's in Hebrews 12. COVID, for me, what it did was, everyone was sent to the room. When I was a little kid, right? When I was a little kid, I didn't get spanked. I actually got sent to my room. And now when I got sent to my room, I didn't have no TV, I didn't have no radio. My parents gave me a book. Go read a book. That was my punishment. I really believe COVID was like God saying, Go read my book. We're at a time now when we hear about you know, wars and rumors of wars, and there's going to be pestilence. It isn't happening like we thought it was going to happen. You need to read the book. And if God sent the world to the room to read the book, what is he trying to do? He's trying to speak to us. I was lying down in my bed and I was thinking to myself, if the world didn't get the lesson the first time, chances are the lesson's going to be compounded. I don't know what that means, but I just know that throughout the tour, when the children of Israel didn't learn their lesson, it actually got magnified. If you got sent to your room again, how would you respond? In this passage, and I'm reading, oops, verse 25, and I'm reading in the Amplified. See, it, see to it that you do not refuse to listen to him who is speaking to you now. For if those sons of Israel did not escape when they refused to listen to him who warned them on earth, revealing God's will, how much less will we escape if we turn our backs on him who warns from heaven? His voice shook the earth at Mount Sinai. But now he has given us a promise saying, Yet once more I will shake not only the earth, but also the heaven. Now this yet once more indicates the removal and the final transformation of those things which can, which can be shaken, that is, which has been created, so that the things which cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us show gratitude and offer God pleasing and acceptable worship with reverence and awe, for our God is indeed a consuming fire. This world is getting ready to shake, that God is speaking from the heavens, that God is saying to, us, saying to us now, I'm getting ready to shake the world again. And if you're trembling, it's because you're not reading the book. We should be like rocks right now. I'm imploring upon you to understand the person that God is looking for at the last days is one that reads the word, trembles at the word, repents, and says, I'm going to be changed. That's living a lifestyle of revival. That's how we see the world transform around us. Not living in fear, but living in victory. Not living in a place where we go ahead and, oh my God, look at all the things happening. I can't believe it but saying, I'm going to rise up above it. Because he's, he's called us to be kings and priests of the Most High God. He has called, not called us to waver. He's called us to stand strong, to walk. Then when people look, they'll say, that guy, that girl, they know Yeshua. Because the world was shaking. Everything that was shaking was being shaken down to the utter core. And the only thing that remained was the kingdom. That the, with the kingdom be birthed within you. Realize that we're receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. We're getting ready to go home. All these things are just a sign to us. We need to get busy about his business. So Abba, Father, I ask you, Lord, that you would pour upon this entire congregation, Father, a spirit, Father, of power, of love, and a sound mind. 
I ask you, Father, that you would overwhelm this congregation with love. For where the spirit of love is, the spirit of fear has been cast out. I ask you, Father, that you would pour upon this congregation the spirit of repentance. Father, may we repent at your word. May we repent and know that what we're called to do in these last days is greater than we can ever imagine or think. But, Father, we just dedicate our lives to you. And we say, Abba, Father, pour your spirit out upon us. Father, help us to learn. B'Shem Yeshua HaMashiach. Amen and amen. Um, amen. Good word. Wait, hold on just a second. Can you hold that track for just one, one? Give me one second. Okay. I just find it funny because, um, you know, this girl, Carrie Job, she came out with this song, and the whole world, God bless her. I mean, she, it was a really good song and everything, but the whole world went crazy over this thing. And started sending out all their uh, YouTube videos in their language, you know? And I was just laughing about it because I was like, the Jews have been singing this song for a long time. And what I would like you to do, if it's possible, is um, would you stand with me? Um, you can start the track now. Um, this is the blessing from number six. This prayer was literally written by God himself, saying to Moses, this is the way that you shall bless the children of Israel so that my name will be upon them. And if you want your name, if you want his name upon you, will you just come up here and let me bless you? Come on up. Yevarecha Adonai Vish Merecha Yaer Adonai Panav Elecha Vichunecha Yisa Adonai Panav Elecha Vyasim Lachem Shalom. Oh, I love it. Thank you, Lord. Shalom, shalom. Lord, bless you and keep you. Make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his, his face toward you, yeah, and give you peace. Oh, his precious peace. And if you agree, sing it with me. Amen. 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 Come on. Amen. Amen. somebody. The Lord bless you and keep you. Make his face shine upon and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his, his face toward you yeah, and give you peace. Keeps it rolling, come on. Oh wow.
put your name on us, Lord. Lord, we give you our lives today. We thank you, Abba. Chasdom, aleinu, lealfei, doroteinu, mishpachteinu, vieladeinu, doroteinu, achareinu, chasdom, aleinu, lealfei, doroteinu, משפחתנו וילדינו, דורותינו, אחרינו, May his favor be upon you and a thousand generations and your family and your children and their children and their children. May his favor be upon you and a thousand generations and your family and your children, and the children, and the children. Adonai, lefanenu, letzidenu, achareinu, mesvimenu, belibenu, hu itanu, hu itanu, bavokel, vaerev, betzetenu, uvoenu, zivlotenu, veotreenu,
Come on one more time. Continue this work even right now. Uh, but thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. I pray for a fresh outpouring of your ruach on your people, God, who love you. I ask you, Father, for Shem Yeshua, God. Come and speak to us today, Lord. Visit us. Thank you, God, that you are releasing gifts, even right now, gifts, Lord, that we don't even know that we exist in us, Lord. I pray you would just release those gifts, Abba. B'Shem Yeshua HaMashiach. Abba, we ask you, Father, for new life, Lord. Lord, we lay down every burden, every burden that we've been carrying. We lay it down before you right now. God, we trust you. We declare today that we trust you, Lord. Can you say, we trust you. I trust you, Lord. I trust you, God. I, I trust you with this thing that I've been carrying. Thank you, Abba, for what you're doing right now, Abba, amongst your people. You're doing something very special in here. Thank you, Abba. Thank you, Abba, as he thunders. Hallelujah. We praise you and thank you, God. Holy Spirit, God, what do you want to do? What do you want to do, Lord? What do you want to do? Something new, Lord. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Yes, Abba. Lord, we just we we just um consecrate ourselves to you again today. God forgive us, Lord, for every way that we've grieved you, Lord. Forgive us, Abba. We ask you, Father, for cleansing, Lord, your ruach. Lord, just coming in like with wind, Lord, just in cleansing us with rivers of living water, Lord, Abba. Right now, in the name of Yeshua, Lord, we lay down every thing, God, that we have been, had our hands, or I just think of this song, be careful, little eyes, what you see. Be careful, little ears, what you hear. Be careful, little mouth, what you speak. God, we ask you, Father, you would help us, Lord. Watch over our mouths, Lord. Help us to take thoughts captive, God. As soon as they come, God, in the name of Yeshua, and cast them down in your mighty name, Lord. This is your battle. This is your battle, Lord. We ask you, Father, in the mighty name of Yeshua, Lord, you teach us how to pray, Lord. You would train our hands for battle and worship, God, in the name of Yeshua, Lord. Help us to worship you, Abba. Help us to worship you, Abba. Thank you, Lord. I know you're doing something new in here because I've never seen this happen before. All the times I've sung this song. Lord, we just thank you, Abba, for releasing your anointing. I pray you release boldness on your people, God, in the name of Yeshua. Lord, I pray, God, that they would be inviting people to, to just come and fellowship in their homes and in, in the congregation. Lord, inviting the lost. They're looking for us to be doing what we're supposed to be doing. It's like somebody out there is just waiting, just waiting for us to get our act together. God, help us. Help us, Lord, to be bold. Help us, Lord, to be walking closely with you so that we can lead many into your kingdom, Abba. And for such a time as this, everybody say, Lazman Haze. Lazman Haze. For such a time. Which incidentally is the name of my ministry, my music ministry, and where you can find some of this music online. And we just thank you, Abba, for what you are doing. I'm gonna turn this over to Rabbi because I, I don't know what else to do. <laughs> Lord, we thank you, God, for what you've done. 
and what you continue to do in Yeshua's name. Abba Father, we just thank you for this time. We give you praise, glory, and honor for keeping the lights on. Father, we thank you that you're thundering, you're roaring from Zion. It's confirming everything that's been done here this evening. Father, let it supernaturally transform us into the image of your Son. Father, let us get back to our first love. Let us come back to you, Yeshua, and let us be bold and not walk in fear in these days but be men and women of uprightness, righteousness, and holiness before you. We seal this tonight right now by the blood of the Lamb. B'Shem Yeshua HaMashiach. Amen.